uh, I love you, babe. Um, I want to acknowledge my sons, Julian and CJ and Colin, who are, and my daddy, who are all watching online this evening. I thank God for them. Uh, Pastor, Bishop, Pastor Tim, and Minister Daniel, the Lord told me to tell you to stand still and see the goodness of the Lord. I know the book of Exodus, it says to stand still and see the salvation, but when he spoke to me concerning you both, he said, stand still and see his goodness. Uh, I also want to give another shout out to my husband. Um, this past weekend, he took me on a brief mini vacation. Um, it's, it's been a long time. They clapping for you, babe. Um, yeah. It's, it's been over well over 10 years at least since we've been on vacation. And y'all know I was a football, basketball mom, and so my life has always been surrounded by those activities. And so, um, you know, I recognize that sometimes in our lives, we can get set in our ways and in our responsibilities and never desire a change or a vacation. And so with me, all the responsibilities of being a wife, a mother, and running a business, and working, and being a caretaker of my dad, I just didn't feel like it was the right time. Um, I would convince myself and say, no, Carly, you can't go. You got this to do. You got that to do. What them boys going to eat for dinner? And yes, I know my boys are grown men, and they can fend for themselves. But I find joy doing these things for my children. So judge your mama. All right, I'm just playing, y'all. Uh, no, but, but, but honestly, you know, there is a time and a place. Um, and so, um, you know, being a mother since I was 13 years old, my life has, the focus has always been responsibility, always making sure and always doing these things. So when, you know, the vacation idea came up, I was like, ah, oh, it's not the right time. I, this, I got that. And I know it was frustrating to Chad because here he's trying to do something for me. You know, because wives, sometimes we can complain about our husbands not doing this and doing that. And when they present the opportunity, we so stuck in our own ways that we don't see that they're trying to do something different. And so I thank you, babe, for that push. Um, it was well needed. Amen. Amen. All right, now you may be wondering when I'm going to get in my Bible study. So just chill, Mo. I'm slow walking you into it, okay? So everybody be patient. You ain't got nowhere to go for the next 35, 40 minutes, amen? Okay? And so um, I wanted to share something real quick. So as Chad and I were preparing uh, to go away, we left on Saturday. Um, you know, when you're going on vacation, you prepare your house, you prepare everything. And so he and I went looking, trying to find us some uh, clothes to take. So we went to a resort, of which we are owners of the timeshare. And so I said, well, let's just get us some clothes to wear, something to take, you know, long sleeves and things of that nature. And so we went from store to store trying to find long sleeve shirts and, and jackets and could not find nothing. And so what we did find was um, short sleeves and, and shorts and those things, bathing suits. And so clearly the stores are preparing for the season that's coming, right, by putting out the different clothes, which leads me to the teaching the Lord gave me called when the weather breaks. For those of you who don't know what that means, it basically means when the weather goes from one season to another. Uh, Chantel shared in her lesson on Easter. <laughs> oh, one of my sons just walked in. That just threw me. <laughs> uh, Chantel shared in her lesson uh, on Easter, the book of Ecclesiastes that talks about, chapter 3, that talks about that there's a season and a time for everything. And clearly, I was looking for a season that had already begun to change. So let us pray. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, God, we give you glory, honor, and praise today, God. You are God all by yourself. You're good all by yourself. You're worthy of all of our praise, God. You're worthy of the honor, God. I thank you, Father, that in this moment, in this time in my life, I'm fully surrendered to you to do your will and to do it your way, God. Increase in me glory to God so that the people, your people, uh, can hear what you, what you have to say to them, God. All of you resides on me, God. I thank you that I speak with your boldness, your authority, your power. Glory to God. With your love and with your correction. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. So most of us have heard the story about Job, a man who was favored in the sight of God, the richest man, a man that even Satan didn't come near. He was off limits as far as Satan understood. Amen? 
He was protected by God. However, one day, when Satan was roaming around, uh, God gave him permission to attack Job, his family, his possessions, but not take his life. Now, my goodness, after all of that loss, who would want to live? That's the question that came to me. You lost your possessions. You lost everything you, you, you own, your cattle, your, all of that stuff, which you earned to make your money and your children. I, I just don't understand. But he said, you cannot touch his life. So the Lord said to me when I pondered, how could someone, how could you want to live last, after that? So the Lord said to me that there is something in the lesson about Job that is missed. And in my research, it said that the book of Job deals with two crucial issues for every person. That's me and you. The problem of suffering and the sovereignty of God. Sovereignty means supreme power or authority. And I don't need to tell you about suffering. If you've been through this life, you've suffered at least once. The sovereignty of God means that God is the ultimate source, ruler over all things. And nothing happens without his will or, position, or permission. And uh, last week when I was watching service online, Pastor Battle mentioned God's sovereignty and how he's able to do it all. So I know that this is a current word for what we need on today. The sovereignty of God is made clear in Job 6.12 when God granted Satan permission to touch all, Job, all that Job had. Remember, God is all-powerful. I know nothing can happen without his permission. And Holy Spirit brought back to my remembrance a song that speaks to the sovereignty of God. And we've sung it in praise and worship quite a few times. And it simply states, for the Lord our God is mighty. Yes, the Lord our God is omnipotent. The Lord our God, he is wonderful. Omnipotent means unlimited power, able to do anything. That's what we are singing when we sing to our God, that he has all power, all authority. And with all the power and all the authority, he is wonderful. Ladies and gentlemen, when we have praise and worship, let these words get into your heart. Praise and worship is crucial to our lives because when service is over, you out here on your own now. Dimitri and, 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 and Lord have mercy. My baby T.T. and the rest of the wonderful singers, they're not there to coach you through. That's right. They're not there to sing you the song no more. You got to remember it and put it here. Now, I, I, I told uh, Chad I was going to join the praise team. He said, no, I'm not. I said, why? Because I can't sing. That's why. <laughs> but it's just because I love the Lord so much. He said, make a, make a joyful noise. Now, that don't mean if, if y'all know what I'm saying, right? Like, I, I'm not saying that. If you can't carry a tune, yeah, you should be up here. No, because we can come on, everybody. Let's just make a little bit of sense, okay? Uh, but I just love him so much. Uh, and so, um, now, Job is remembered in chapter 1. Now, you can go there in just a second. It's just to follow me. You don't have to. But in Job chapter 1, he's remembered as a man who's blameless and upright. He did no wrong. He feared God and shunned evil. He had seven sons and three daughters. He owned 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, and 500 donkeys, and had many servants. Now, I want you to remember this next statement. It says, he was the greatest man among all the people of the east. But with all that, his season was beginning to change. So I asked the Lord, if Job was all these things, why would you allow him to lose it all when he was generally a good person? He said that there was something in Job that needed to come out. He was known for having these possessions, but how was he known in suffering? If you've ever been in a season for so long or a long time, it is possible to become spiritually numb or blind to the sovereignty of God. Because now you're thinking, where is this powerful God in all the hell that I'm in? It's been seven years. It's been six months. It's been a long time. I've been in ministry all these years, and yet these same issues keep arising. I keep giving the same instructions, yet the same mistakes are being made.
That thought right there, when you question whether or not the all-powerful God is present, demonstrates that you don't have a true understanding of the sovereignty of God. His sovereignty does not diminish or evaporate when we go through things. It took me a long time to see that. Because when you've been hurt and when you've gone through things, you, we talk about God is love and he, he loves us so much. But when you go through something, when you're disappointed and when you're rejected and when you told no, when they told you yes the first time, what, I don't understand, Lord. I don't understand what does your power have to do with what they did to me. I love it when he told Moses in the books of, book of Exodus, chapter 3. Now I want you all to go there. Exodus, chapter 3. He says, I am that I am, which was his response when Moses asked, who shall I say sent me to the children of Israel? Exodus chapter 3, verse 1. And we're going to start right now. Verse 1. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that the bush, that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, ladies and gentlemen, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight. Why the bush does not burn up. And that's what the enemy thinks at times when he continuously tests us. Why are they still going to church? Why are they still studying their word? Why are they singing to the Lord? I thought by now, when they got divorced, or when their spouse passed, or when their children passed, that that would surely break them. Verse 4, when the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from the, within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Jacob, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. Verse 7. The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. Now, commercial break. As I was preparing for this lesson, what does Bishop Tim always tell us? To put yourself in the story. Scratch out their name and put your name. Because I'm going to tell you something, ladies and gentlemen. If you want to experience breakthrough, if you want to understand and feel this word that's in this Bible, try that exercise. I promise you you will look at God's word differently. So what I did was I reread that verse, and I said this, and you can put yourself in there as I'm saying it. The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my prophet Carla in Waldorf. I have heard her crying out because of the issues in her life, and I am concerned about her suffering. See, sometimes we go through life thinking nobody cares. Where is this God? that says he loves me, does he care about my suffering? Does he care that I've been fasting? Does he care that I've been hurting? That, does he care I've been going from church to church trying to find somebody that can minister to me? Does he care? This verse tell you he does. Verse 8. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of the land into a good and spa spacious land. That's weather breaking. Because what did I tell you the title was? When the weather breaks. That's weather breaking. He said, I'm going to come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and bring them up out of the, that land into a good and spacious land. 
a land flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. Mm -hmm. Verse 9, and now the cry of the Israelites have reached me, and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So the Lord has seen what the enemy has been doing, and he's decided to come down and rescue you. Verse 9, 10, I'm sorry. So now go. I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring to my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. Verse 11. But Moses said to God, now God done told him what he was going to do and what he needed him to do. Yet he said, but God, but Moses, I mean, mm, y'all know what I'm trying to say. Moses said to God, who am I to say? So he's questioning already. When God already told you, he already gave you the instructions. He told you what he was going to do. But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? What God has called us to do, ladies and gentlemen, is not what you put on your resume. It's not a searchable skill that you've learned at your job. What God has called you to do, life has shaped you to do the good, the bad, all of it. <clears throat> Verse 12, and God said, I will be with you, and this will be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. Verse 13, Moses said to God, suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers have sent me to you and they ask me what is his name then what shall I tell him again God already done told this man what to do question after question how many times have God given us instructions and we consider everything but the instruction I was going on vacation I considered what the boys going to eat I considered are they going to make sure daddy has this but are they going to sweep that kitchen? Because I know them sometimes. They leave crumbs on the floor. <laughs> Meanwhile, my husband wants to do something for me. Now, here comes my favorite part, verse 14. God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. Verse 15. God also said to Moses, say to the Israelites, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever. The name you shall call me. God also said to Moses, say to the Israelites, the Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and J God of Jacob has sent me to you. Now, reading this, God was giving clues to the children of Israel so that they can identify who he was. He told him, I'm the God of your fathers, right? But then he also said, I am that I am. We cannot get too familiar with God, ladies and gentlemen. Don't think you know him too well, because you don't. We cannot put him in a box. No box can contain him. This is my name forever. The name you shall call me from generation to generation. Verse 16, go assemble the elders of Israel and say to them, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob appeared to me and said, I have watched over you, and I have seen what you have, what have been done to you in Egypt, and I promised to bring you up out of your misery in Egypt into the land of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jezebites, a land flowing with milk and honey. Verse 18, the elders of Israel will listen to you. Then you and the elders are to go to the king of Egypt and say to him, the Lord, the God of the Hebrews have, has met with us. Let us take a three-day journey into the wilderness to offer sacrifices to the Lord our God. But I know that the king of Egypt will not let you go unless a mighty hand compels him. Okay? Here comes that mighty hand. So I will stretch out my hand and strike the Egyptians with all the wonders that, will perform, that I will perform among them. After that, he will let you go. The sovereignty of God. And I will make the Egyptians favorably disposed toward this people. Ladies and gentlemen, these people that have held them captive have done them wrong. God said, 
he's going to make them favorably be disposed toward the people that they held captive. So that when you leave, you will not go empty handed. Verse 22. Every woman is to ask her neighbor and any woman living in her house for articles of silver and gold and for clothing, which you will, which you will put on your sons and daughters. And so you will plunder the Egyptians. These verses, ladies and gentlemen, speak to the sovereignty and the omnipotence of God. Here are the very people that were causing pain and misery to the children of Israel. God said, I'm going to make them favor you, and they will give you riches. He was able to do that because he has what? All power and all authority, and nothing happens without his permission. He is able to do it all. Now, let's go back to Job. Now, his story is different than the children of Israel. He's living large and in charge, right? Uh, He wasn't suffering like the children of Israel. As a matter of fact, those kids of his were living large and partying. The Bible says in Job 1, starting at verse 4, that his sons used to hold feasts in their homes. And I'm going to be paraphrasing, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, They used to hold feasts in their homes on their birthdays, and they would invite their three sisters to drink eat and drink with them. And when the partying was over, Job, being a good daddy, would make arrangements for them to be purified. He would get up with the birds in the morning and sacrifice a burnt offering for each of them. That's ten offerings. Because he thought they did too much at the party. Too many shots. Smoked too much weed. Popped too many pills. And the Bible says he did this on a regular. Because his kids party. Now, I don't know about you, but for me, I ain't sent no burnt offering. But there's times that I've fasted and I've prayed for my children because I've seen things I didn't like. And so Job was, to me, doing what any parent would do, right? So now we know who Job was, his character and his riches. Yet God permitted his season to change, but not take his life. When the season begins to change in our lives, you will begin to see things in your environment change. I'm going to give you an analogy. Winter. They can last a little longer than the other seasons because what? When the groundhog is sees his shadow, isn't he see it? It lasts. Winter lasts longer, right? That's what they say. Yeah. But anyhow, winter is the most difficult month to me because you have to do a lot. You got to wear boots, scarves, gloves. You got to warm your car up 20 minutes early. You got to go shovel some snow. You got to put down the salt. You got to cook hot food. You got to buy cough syrup. You got to take off from work because you don't caught a cold. You got to get a vaccine because it's flu season. You got to avoid the potholes from the snow. I didn't realize we do all that, huh? But when spring approaches, the stores that sold all that stuff that we needed for the winter have changed their merchandise for the upcoming season. Now they're stocking up on things like short sleeve shirts, shorts, dresses, bathing suits, sandals, grass seed, swimming pools, cookout shoes for the men. Uh, <laughs> now all these items present a different picture. These are the things that are enjoyable for us. A shovel, cry hoses, a shovel. These Let me read that again. Now all these items present a different picture. The things I just read are enjoyable because we know it's the springtime, we're going swimming, but the shovel and potholes represents a different picture. But here's the problem when you have become spiritually numb or blind to the sovereignty of God. You will keep looking for things in the season that God has ended. So for the sake of this analogy, I'm going to say that Chad and I were blind to the season changing because we went from store to store looking for some winter clothes when the environment has clearly changed. And what that showed is when the environment, when the season changed, we must change. Now, earlier I mentioned that everyone knew who Jacob was and his goodness and wealth, but what did he look like in suffering? We're going to look at that. Let's go to Job chapter 2, verse 11. And I'm going to read from the NLV version. And it says, when three of Job's friends heard of the tragedy he had suffered, remember, he done lost his, his children, his, his cattle, everything. They got together and traveled from their homes to comfort and console him. Their names were Eliphaz, the Temanite, Billy Dad, the Shuite, and Zophar, the name of light site. Y'all know what I'm saying. Verse 12, when they saw Job from a distance, they scarcely recognized him. This is how he looked in suffering. Wailing loudly, they tore their robes and threw dust in the air over their heads to show their grief. Then they sat on the ground with him for seven days and seven nights. No 
No one said a word to Job, for they saw that his suffering was too great for words. Now, if you read the story about Job, if you're familiar with it, Job was very frustrated with his life. As a matter of fact, the Bible says he cursed his own life. Now, I've been frustrated with God about my life, but I ain't never cursed it. So I recognize that it was a reason my mom and dad's a mess. It just wasn't for that one night of fun. But I've said to God, here I am changing for you, Lord. Doing what you want me to do. Speaking your word. I'm going to church. I'm singing songs. I'm not just living the life in church, but I'm living it outside. And let you and and yet you keep letting the enemy touch me over and over. And in that moment, as I was teaching, I'm preparing this, I recognized that me and Joe were similar because we both lack the true understanding of the sovereignty of God. In life, it's easy to think that God isn't with us because of what we're going through. Clearly, the children of Israel thought that because why did God have to tell them, but God is with you? He sent, God sent to them, Moses, to demonstrate his power and to say, listen, I know your misery and I am concerned about you. And to even make it more real to you, I am the God your mom and daddy told you about. See, Briara, you come to learn the dad, the God of your father and your mother. You, ain't, you, don't, you don't just hear about him. Now you know about him, my son. Now they've come to learn about the God that their mom and daddy talk about. I recall a moment speaking to my mother some years ago. She's been passed about 12 years now, but prior to her passing, she said to me, how do you think that I'm able to go through all that I'm going through? And what she was referring to was her uh, terminal illness of cancer. But at the time, I didn't know it was terminal. She said, I gave it to God. And I never forgot that. So I stand here today serving the God of my mama. And even though she's gone on to glory, I still serve him. I still serve him. He's the one that she told me to give my cares to. So Job then went through all his emotions, a curse in life, questioning God, thinking he knew God to seeing a change in the seat, to thinking he knew God to seeing a change in the season. The season for him changed in chapter 42, which is the last chapter in the book. The last chapter, 42 chapters. But in the last chapter, he began to see. He began to understand omnipotence and the sovereignty of God. Verse 2 says in chapter 42, I know that you can do anything. And I know, and no one can stop you. Verse 3, you ask, who is that that questions my wisdom with such ignorance? It is I, and I was talking about things I knew nothing about. Things far too wonderful for me. Verse 4, you said, listen, and I will speak. I have some questions for you, and you must answer them. I have only heard about you before, but now I have seen you with my own eyes. I take back everything I said, and I sit in dust and ashes to show my repentance. See, Job now had changed with that season through repentance. He recognized, I don't know nothing what I'm talking about. But yet I'm questioning God about what he's doing and why he's doing it. And I don't like how you're doing it. And I don't want you to do it no more. But he came to his senses. So Job and his friends all had their interpretation of who they thought God was. But it was ultimately Job that finally got it, the one who had suffered so much. It is amazing the understanding that can come from suffering. The Bible says in chapter 42 that God was angered by Job's two friends and required them to take seven bulls and seven rams and to go to his servant Job and offer a burnt offering for themselves. He told them, he told them that Job was going to pray for them. And he would accept his prayer on their behalf. He said, I will not treat you as you deserve. For you have not spoken accurately about me. 
as my servant Job had. Now, don't forget, y'all, that Job had lost everything but his life. He dealt with his friends' opinions, their banter, how he was going through his suffering, to now being tasked to pray for them. All before restoration took place. Ladies and gentlemen, his life is not about you and me. There's a far greater picture that God has created. And so sometimes when we have relationships with family and friends that have been severed because of offense, because mama loves you more or daddy loves you more, I don't want to talk to you anymore. I don't want to have a relationship with you. Meanwhile, God is trying to get that up out of you so that you can pray for them. It wasn't about what they were doing to you. And sometimes we don't see that picture. All we see is the offense. All we see is the hurt. All we see is the anger. But when you turn and repent, like Job did, he told God, I don't know what I'm talking about. I don't know what I'm talking about. I question you, not even understanding who you are, your power. All knowing, able to do anything. He's able to do anything. How do I know? Because I'm standing here. Because, see, you don't know me. <laughs> you don't know me. You think you know me. You know what I let you know about me. But there's some things on the inside of me that God is still dealing with. Because I became a prophet, I didn't become one. God called me that along before I was born in my mother's womb. So I didn't apply for it. A lot of times people think when they come to ministry that they're going to fill out an application to be an evangelist, a pastor, a preacher, a prophet, or uh, 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 whatever else. If God called you, you'll operate in it. Now, what was I saying? I feel like Bishop Tim. Um, <laughs> I was talking about um, the relationships. <sighs> Minister Beverly taught one time, the, not one time, she taught a couple of, a few weeks ago. And one of the things she talked about in her lesson, it was about Joseph and his siblings. And she said, a lot of you may not get this lesson, but some of you will. And y'all know that Joseph's siblings betrayed him, and he was in prison. They reunited, blah, blah, blah. And the Lord told me that I need you to forgive your siblings. And I can't consider what I've gone through with them. I have to obey the instructions of the Lord because he's all-powerful. He's all-knowing, and he's able to heal my heart. He's able to bring us back together again so that before my father calls home, he'll see his children together. Because that is the ultimate thing. Ladies and gentlemen, we can't keep walking around holding grudges, being angry that mama didn't do what she was supposed to do and daddy didn't do what he was supposed to do. Nobody is perfect but God. And we have to have forgiveness in our hearts. Whether they ask for it, they deserve it, God requires it. It is important that we stay close. To God and obey his instructions for every season. Here's why. Verse 10 said, when Job prayed for his friends, the Lord restored his fortunes. In fact, the Lord gave him twice as much as before. Then all his brothers, sisters, and former friends came and feasted with him in his home. And they consoled him and comforted him because of all the trials the Lord had brought against him. And each of them brought him a gift of money and a gold ring. See, after your season of suffering, not only will God bless you, he will send others to bless you. 
Verse 12. So the Lord blessed Job in the second half of his life, even more than in the beginning. For now he had 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camel, 1,000 teams of oxen, and 1,000 female donkeys. He also gave Job seven more sons and three more daughters. He named his first daughter, we're going to call her Jimmy, the second Keziah, and the third Karen Hapuch. Verse 15, in all the land, no women were as lovely as the daughters of Job. And their father put them into his will along with their brothers. Verse 16. Job lived 140 years after that, living to see four generations of his children and grandchildren. Verse 17, then he died an old man who had lived a long, full life. Now, remember I told you, what did they say about Job in the beginning? They said uh, Job was known as the greatest man in all the East. But look how he's remembered in death. He died an old man who lived a long, full life. It wasn't so much about what he owned anymore. He lived a full life. So with all the possessions he had, with all the suffering that he went through, with all the loss, and then God restored him, he lived a full life, a full life. To me, his legacy in death is far greater than it was in life. He is known to have gone through suffering obeyed God and received double the blessings that God in his sovereignty had already planned. No matter what they say, what they think, the hell we encounter, the disappointments we face, the heartache we experience, the loss, the rejection, the betrayal, the beating, the pressing on every side, God is still all powerful and able to do anything. When the season changes, we must change. The scripture on my mother's headstone says, have faith in God. Have faith in God, ladies and gentlemen, because after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace who have called you to his eternal glory in Christ will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. That's found in 1 Peter 5. Verse 10. Amen, saints. Amen. That's all I got. So, to God be the glory. Before we close out, um, I have some announcements that I'm, that I'm going to share with everyone. New Partners class, if you're new to Liberty, guess what? We invite you to the New Partners class. It's just for you. Class has already begun, but you still have time to join. It's next Sunday at 8.30 a.m. in the sanctuary. This class will last for eight weeks. And upon completion, you will graduate. Ah, I just heard that in the spirit. Once we complete our suffering, we will graduate. Please say Ivy Davis or Brianna Hunt after service to sign up on Sunday. I am my sister's keeper. Ladies, yeah. is that time this weekend? Yes, it is. Please join us for I am my sister's keeper friendship edition on Saturday, April the 13th at 10 a.m. For a time of fun and fellowship, please bring your girlfriends, your BFFs with you. And remember to wear a shade of orange in honor of our beautiful sister, Angela Hubbard. Uh, Liberty Christian Church Youth ad Young Adult Kickback. Uh, we are inviting all young adults between 14 and 21, I just missed the cutoff, mm. to join us for an evening of fellowship on April 20th from <laughs> 6 to 8.30 to RSVP. Please visit www.LibertyYAK.com. Money Matters Part 2. Join us for our information session, Money Matters Part 2, on sub Sunday, April the 28th at 1 p.m. Financial professionals will be presenting topic on topics such as investing, 529 accounts, mortgage payoff, and credit, debit, credit debt management. Ladies and gentlemen, please take advantage of this. Because if you wonder why you will never have no money, you can come here and learn why. <laughs> Volunteers, Liberty, we need you. Please sign up on the volunteer sheets in the foyer after service. We have several slots on the volunteer forms that need to be filled in. This should be coming off of the announcements, ladies and gentlemen. We shouldn't be asking for volunteers at this point. We should not be asking for volunteers. I don't care who you are, which, which you need to be signed up. 
And that's for me. That ain't from nobody else. Save the date. Liberty's 11th anniversary. Friday, May 3rd, a day of fasting and prayer from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. Then we will hold intercessory prayer at 7 p.m. at Liberty. Saturday, May 4th, all the dads can wear their cookout shoes. We're going to be cooking out in the lot. Bring your own chairs. Bring your own chairs and bring your own chairs. Tables, your own tables and your own tables and your tents. Okay? Because I don't want nobody to say, well, I thought. No, nope, because I done said it three times. May 5th, praise en blanc on the lot. We will be wearing, what did I say? That, that went real fast. We will be wearing all white for outdoor service. Liberty Apparel, we have a new collection of Liberty Apparel. Shop today and be sure to wear your T-shirts to our anniversary cookout. The link to purchase can be found in the weekly newsletter or on the church website. And lastly but not least, we warmly, warmly invite you to attend the Celebration of Life for our very own Pastor no Reginald D. Thornton, husband of Marissa Thornton. Services will be held Friday, April the 19th, uh, at New Smyrna Missionary Baptist Church. The address, is, the address is 4417 Douglas Street Northeast, Washington, D.C. The viewing will be held from 9 a.m. to 1130 a.m. Service will be held from 1130 to 1230. So that is the end of our announcements. I'm going to close us out in prayer. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you, Father, for it is finished, God. I thank you, Father, that we obey your instructions just like you tell us to do, God, that we don't consider anything else but what it would take to please you, God. Continue to speak through us, God. Continue to show us who you are, God. I thank you that our hearts and our eyes are open to receive from you, Lord. And we give your name all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen to everybody online.